Dear Mr. Nadu uh, Gudubu Zaman Bukali, dear Chairman Mr. Wang Li, dear Mr. Uh, Jeff Leung, Ms. Uh, uh, Shanti Abraham, and friends all from all over the world. Uh, this is uh, Harrison, Secretary General of the Battle Road Service Connections. It's my honor to host today's conference. We are now all suffering a significant impact due to COVID-19. It's making our work uh, very difficult. We have to work remotely. We have to make our communications very online. On this special occasion, please allow me on behalf of all the members of BRC and BRMC to extend our heartfelt welcome and gratitude to all of you to join our online conference Today's conference consists of two parts. One is pub public lecture on international commercial mediation. The topic is mediation and the resolution of COVID-19 forcible disputes. The other is signing ceremony between International Commercial Mediation Center for the Battle Road and Malaysia Mediation Center. First of all, it's our good pleasure for me to introduce our speaker. They are Mr. Jeff Leung and Ms. Shanti Abraham. Mr. Jeff Leung, Chairman, Corporator of Securities and Investment Law Standing Committee of Law Association for Asia and the Pacific, Co-Chair of Belt Road Standing Committee, Law Association for Asia and the Pacific. Mediator of BRMC and IMC, having 30 years of advising Chinese investors on FDI, MA, and business transactions. Ms. Shanti Abraham, she's the founder of Shanti Abraham Associates in Malaysia. She has been called to Singapore and the Malaysia bar, has been in practice for over 25 years. Shanti is an SIMI certified mediator and has a public profile on the SIMI mediator website. She is a credit mediator on the panel of Securities Industry Dispute Resolution Center. Now, please join me in welcoming them to give us the lecture. Jeff, please. Uh Good afternoon, everyone. I bring you greetings. Um, let me put the slide up. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Yes. Uh, as I said, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I bring you greetings from Malaysia. And I thank uh, our host, uh, Harrison Chia Hui, for his kind introduction. And I trust all is well with all of you as we take cover from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, that is sweeping around the world. And uh, as we learn how to work from home, even something like this, speaking to all of you on a virtual, media, uh, virtual conference is also the first time for me. Um, let me begin also by talking about the current situation we are in. At this moment, the COVID-19 economic crisis is already here. In Malaysia, factories are closing. Just a couple of days ago, oil and gas companies are suffering tremendous losses. Uh, oil price is falling to below zero. In fact, minus 37 US dollar per barrel. Now what is uh, now creating uh, uh, for all of us is a situation where working as per normal, like before the crisis began, is no longer possible. And we are learning how to work in a new way. 
uh, while taking cover and trying to avoid getting infected by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, what is already apparent at this point in time is that the mother of all great depressions is already now happening. Due to the COVID-19 pan uh, pandemic, supply chains are now being disrupted, businesses are closed, and contracts are broken because the parties are find finding it difficult uh, to fulfill their contractual obligations. How do we, as part of the business community and the global economic ecosystem, help to re resolve the disputes that are now arising? Uh, from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So these are the questions that we are facing today. Uh, many countries are talking about their own domestic COVID-19 laws. Singapore has already enacted uh, a COVID law, the United Kingdom as well. And China has uh, certain uh, laws allowing the issue of uh, forced merger certificates uh, to resolve disputes. Even Malaysia, I had a meeting a couple of days ago where we presented the situation to the government. Uh, agencies and asking for help from the government to resolve some of the crisis that is happening here in Malaysia as well. And one of the proposals include coming up with a COVID-19 law for Malaysia. Now the other bigger problems that is affecting for our work, uh, affecting all of us in our work, is the fact that uh, breach of international contracts are also happening due to COVID-19 lockdowns and closures. First it happened in China, now it's, happened, it's happening around the world. And uh, it is a fact that, as, as I will explain later, a uh, breach of international contracts will necessarily be governed by the terms of the contract. And forced major and frustration of contract are the two common legal issues affecting all countries. Uh, I will uh, later on in this lecture uh, explain the situation using Malaysia as an example. And we also know that all international co uh, contracts are governed by choice of law or proper law of the contract and resolution clauses. Uh, let me talk a bit about the situation here in Malaysia. Uh, under Malaysian law, there are two concepts that we have to deal with uh, when a, a contract cannot be performed due to uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic closures and lockdown. Uh, under Section 57, uh, two of the Contracts Act, basically says that a contract to do an act which after the contract is made become impossible or by reason of some event which the promiser could not prevent becomes unlawful. This contract will become void when that act becomes impossible or unlawful. So the doctrine of frustration of contract is the, uh, uh, one of the first uh, uh, area that we have to look into uh, to decide uh, how to resolve uh, a breach of contract uh, due to inability to perform the contract arising from the COVID-19 crisis. Now, the test that is uh, used by Malaysian courts is uh, to say that, well, if uh, frustration occurs, is whenever the law recognizes without, uh, whenever the law recognizes without default of either party, a contractual obligation has become incapable of being performed because the circumstances in which the performance is called for will render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. So I think for a COVID crisis kind of breach due to lockdown, I think the, the, the fact that it is not the fault of either party is easier to, uh, uh, to prove. Uh, it's, the, and it, uh, it's becoming incapable of being performed because people are being uh, forced to stay at home. This is also easy to prove. It is a third part, a last part, which says that it must be radically different from what was undertaken by the contract. Uh, I think from the SARS uh, situation in Hong Kong many years ago, uh, there was a tenancy contract. Uh, there was a closure for a short period of time for a two-year tenancy. In that situation, the court uh, ruled that it was not that radically different from what was undertaken uh, by the contract and it was not allowed to be terminated. The tenancy contract was not allowed to be terminated. So I think in this sort of situation, when we look at frustration of contracts, we have to look at the different facts of the different cases. Now, uh, in the Malaysian case of uh, Guan Igmo, uh, the Court of Appeal has laid down the three elements uh, for 
proving frustration of contract. Firstly, the event must have been one for which no provision has been made in the contract. The event must be one. Second, the event must be one for which the party was not responsible, cannot be served in this. So these two uh, are probably easier to uh, 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 prove as well. And like I said just now, the third part, radically different, is the one that the court will probably go into the facts of all the case, cases before them to decide what is practically unjust uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to find that it is practically unjust to enforce the original promise or contractual obligation. So this is the first area that uh, most of us from common law countries will look into, the doctrine of frustration of contract. The next area is force major clauses. Uh, most contracts will have force major clauses and some of them will not provide for a force major clause. Then you will have no choice but to uh, rely on the doctrine of frustration. Now where you have a force major clause, uh, what it is is basically uh, a contractual term where one or both of the parties is entitled to be excused from the performance of the contract in whole or in part and is entitled to suspend the performance or claim extension of time for performance upon the happening of a specified event or events beyond his control. Now, whether a party can invoke the first major clause due to COVID-19 or the lockdown measures uh, that are implemented will depend on the wording of the first major clause and the fact of each case. So some of the questions we will have to ask when we read the clauses uh, is COVID-19 or the relevant restriction under lockdown measures uh, special, specifically within the force major events covered by the clause? For example, does the clause specifically set up pandemic or epidemic, uh, business or travel restrictions or government actions? And uh, secondly, can it fall if, if, if it is not that specifically drafted? then can the event uh, that is happening, the facts of the case, fall within the general wording? For example, an event beyond the control of the parties. Uh, also, are there conditions invoking the clause? Do you need to give a notice? And if so, are these conditions or have these conditions been satisfied? And is the consequence of a false major event occurring provided for in the clause, for example, suspension of a period of time following by, followed by termination after expiry of the period or termination immediately? And if yes, what if the, is the lockdown period within or outside the state specified period? So these are some of the, the thinking process we need to go through uh, when we examine the actual force major clause that is within the contract. Uh, does the clause require a party to mitigate the effects of the force major event by making alternative arrangements to perform the contract? Is the performance of, of the obligation totally prevented or is it merely uh, made more difficult or delay? Is the contract capable of being performed in a different manner? Is the contract capable of being performed in part? So these are the issues that we need to look into as we read the clause. Sometimes the clauses are simple. Sometimes the clauses provide for a lot of these uh, 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 possibilities that I've just uh, talked about just now. Now the effect is of the clause will usually be provided in the clause itself. It, it can include complete release or excuse the parties from performing the obligations. Uh, there may be a period of suspension. The parties are required to take mitigating steps, depending on what is written there. Uh, and if the first major event exists beyond the said period, parties may be released and excused from performance of their respective obligations under the contract. Now, I have taken a, a, an example of two force major clause uh, just to explain what we usually see. Uh, Article 7 uh, of the PAM contract. PAM contract is the uh, professional architects of Malaysia standard contract that is used by the uh, uh, construction industry here in Malaysia. So for Chinese company undertaking belt and road projects in Malaysia, some of them are using the PAM standard form contracts. Now in this PAM contract 2006, the uh, force major is defined as any circumstances beyond the contractor's control caused by terrorist acts, governmental or regulatory action, epidemics and natural disasters. So with a clause like this, uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic or pandemic will be covered. And so too the government lockdown actions under government uh, and regulatory action. So a clause like this is simple and uh, can be easily uh, uh, interpreted. But if the clause is vague and parties enter into dispute, then the parties may be forced 
to go to a third party to, re to resolve the dispute. That's when they either go to an adjudicator or to a mediator, arbitrator, or finally to the court. The other clause uh, is an example of a clause where it specifies a requirement of a 10-day notice. Right? Uh, if you are unable to perform an obligation because of false nature, as soon as reasonably practicable, uh, reasonably practicable, not later than 10 business days after the event arises, you must notify the other party. Right? It talks about suspension, it talks about uh, using best endeavor to minimize the impact of the false major event. Uh, neither party is excused from obligation to pay money because of the false major event, despite any provision of the agreement. And if it continues more than 30 business days, the party may at its discretion reject the products, terminate the agreement by giving notice. So looking at this, uh, the importance of a well-drafted false major contract is uh, going to decide uh, whether uh, disputes arising from uh, 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 COVID-19 false major is going to be resolved quickly. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, if you look at the way contracts are being put together by business people, sometimes they have not consulted lawyers. So the contracts are poorly drafted, maybe the false major clause is not there, and if so, it is a false major clause that is uh, weakly drafted or from some other examples that is not fit for the purpose or use of their own uh, situation. So because of this, I think the likelihood of uh, disputes arising uh, over uh, false major uh, events and frustration or contract is going to come uh, in a big wave. Uh, I think what is happening in China now uh, is, 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 is something that uh, we can look to, but because uh, the closures and lockdowns are also now happening around the world, uh, we are facing situations that are likely to be different from China. Now, for the Chinese uh, situation, I think uh, uh, CCPIT has come up uh, with the backing of the Ministry of Commerce, uh, providing with this uh, certificate, uh, uh, false merger certificates to Chinese companies uh, based on documents proving that they cannot meet their contractual obligations. Now, I think within China, governed by Chinese law, uh, these contracts and the uh, issuance of a CCPIT, false major certificates will be able to resolve a, a, a large number of those disputes in China. Uh, but what happens if it is an international contract and not governed by Chinese law, or is an international contract governed by foreign law, let's say English law, Singapore law, Hong Kong law, and it is to be resolved uh, uh, by foreign arbitration or in foreign courts. Uh, These false major certificates issued by uh, the Chinese authorities by CCPIT may not be conclusive and may not be accepted by foreign arbitrators and foreign courts. So these are issues that we are entering into that will complicate uh, and prevent uh, quick resolution of the disputes. Now I just want to uh, set the scenario for Shanti to take over in the next segment of the lectures to talk about mediation. Uh, by just highlighting the fact that the parties to international commercial contracts with Chinese companies have a wide range of options for resolving false major disputes, ranging from negotiations, adjudication, mediation, to arbitration and litigation. I think in a situation like the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, lockdowns and the disruptions coming from that, it's really happening beyond the control of the parties. Personally, I think mediation is the preferred option. Uh, factors to consider in a desperate situation like this is a long-term business relationship between the parties. The parties are happy with each other. They are happily doing business with each other for so many years. And suddenly this pandemic comes and they have a dispute as to who should bear responsibility. I think how you can resolve the uh, 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 dispute quickly uh, bearing the business relationship in mind, I think most of them will probably negotiate with each other because they have a long-term business relationship before. And the problem is with negotiations is everybody says, you know, uh, well, it's okay. Uh, I will forgive your, your, your late delivery. Can you put me as priority for your next shipment out? So if everybody dealing with the Chinese company or any other companies around the world that supply goods to other countries or other, other business parties, they all ask for first priority. It's impossible also to solve uh, some of these disputes to, through negotiations. So adjudication and mediation, I think, has to be considered. Then you have the situation of cash flow. Uh, most of the uh, people now suffering from uh, COVID-19 disruption is the fact that people have stopped paying. 
So there's a shortage of cash. So even if you say go for arbitration or litigation, you have to spend a lot of time fighting all those uh, uh, arbitration and litigation cases. At the end of which, with the uh, arbitration award to enforce or judgment, uh, the company may not be around anymore for you to get payment because they are all suffering. And finally, of course, urgency. The faster you resolve this, the better. So in Malaysia, uh, we are looking at a situation where even though uh, uh, there are suggestions that we should follow Singapore to have assessors, voluntary assessors, to make a quick decision on this sort of disputes and not allow it to be appealed to the courts later on and lawyers are not allowed to act for them. Uh, this is the situation in Singapore under the COVID law. For Malaysia, we have proposed uh, uh, national mediation uh, initiative for resolution of COVID-19 uh, disputes, uh, not just for contracts, but also for employer-employee relationships as people are being uh, laid off uh, from their jobs. So we see a lot of this coming and uh, disputes coming. And we feel that mediation is uh, the best way. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, pass the time over to Shanti uh, to take over and explain to you uh, uh, why mediation is better and how to undertake mediation in this current situation that people cannot meet face to face and especially how to undertake uh, an, a mediation uh, across borders on international contractual disputes arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. One moment. All right. Uh, my screen, uh, can my slides be seen? Can I just yes. confirm that? Fantastic. Yes. So thank you very much. A good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Harrison and Wang Li and the, the team that has been supporting for the organization of this MOU online. Um, this is my first experience doing an MOU and giving a public lecture uh, internationally, and this is a real privilege. Um, one of the, the good things about uh, this particular time, I think it's for us to sit back and reflect on how we can do things a bit better. And I think at this, this time, this MOU is uh, very timely because it's going to ignite the imagination of all advisors to now start thinking more creatively because we're looking at a scenario where um, our clients are going to be in severe cash uh, crunches. And so therefore, they're going to require us as advisors to come up with swifter, smarter solutions for all of them. Uh, on that note, I will begin. Right, uh, this is a little bit of a speaker profile. Um, I am an arbitrator and a mediator. Of, of many hats I wear as a litigator and adjudicator as well, I must say one of my deepest passions is in mediation. And uh, I hope to share uh, some of my thoughts today. Now, for those who are joining and tuning in who may not be familiar with where mediation falls in the dispute resolution process. Um, typically, negotiation, as what Jeff mentioned, is where the parties themselves try to solve problems without advisors. Invariably, there will be times where parties hold their respective positions uh, because of their own underlying interests, and that's when they hit an impasse. At that point, a lot of parties feel that their only option is to go into an adversarial um, a dispute resolution process like adjudication or arbitration or litigation. Um, what tends to be underutilized is the possibility of using mediation, which is where the parties come together to discuss the issues that uh, they can't overcome on their own. And the mediator is able to navigate some of these stickier issues, identify what it is that is keeping the parties in dispute and exploring many solutions to see how the parties can come up with a solution that they're both prepared to live with. A quick overview of the mediation process is this. Because the aim of a mediation is for a swift, commercially sound resolution, the process has to be voluntary. This means the parties are invited uh, to come and discuss, and they have the first agreement which is to agree on the process with which they will try to find a solution. 
they obviously will have a disagreement on the issues itself, but that is no uh, hindrance or bar to them agreeing to a process where they come together and the uh, parties are uh, given an opportunity to have an authentic conversation. What is special about this authentic conversation is that it is confidential. And in this case, the Malaysian law protects communications in a mediation. It is all confidential. Ex and there are a few exceptions when there is fraud and criminal elements, but by and large, all communications are confidential. The other advantage of mediation is that it is highly flexible and the process can be designed by the mediators to fit the needs of the parties. Today, we are looking at the reality of cross-border online mediation because traveling has been uh, curtailed and it may be curtailed for a long time. And now the burden is on the parties to find a, a way where they can actually have this conversation and mediators can design the process where parties are able to meet online, meet in private sessions with the mediator. No decision is imposed by the mediator because ultimately the goal is to get the parties to find a workable solution. The role of a neutral facilitator is advantageous because the parties understand and know that no one's going to impose a decision on them. Uh, declaring one a winner and one a loser. At the end of the day, if both parties are able to find a swift and a commercially sound uh, resolution, they're both really uh, successful and winners in that regard. Now, what is critical in any mediation is that the decision maker is, has to be in the room or available for discussion. And this is because the goal is to find a solution. And so decision makers need to work um, uh, need to work together with their advisors to be able to help uh, come up with a decision uh, within the time that has been fixed for me. So to summarize, in mediation, the decision makers are not a judge, not an arbitrator, not an adjudicator, but the parties themselves. And their collaborators are their lawyers. The navigator is the mediator. At the end of the day, everyone knows what the dispute is all about. But in coming to a solution, what the parties will be um, asked to share are their underlying interests. And going forward, I think um, the availability of cash flow will be one of the key components of any discussion uh, going forward. So a snapshot of mediation in Malaysia. Uh, mediation has been around since 1999. And as I said earlier, it's governed by statute. We have a Mediation Act. Uh, it, it was in 2012. It is pending amendment because uh, like China, Malaysia is also a signatory to the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Uh, in Malaysia, mediation is available on an ad hoc basis, as well as through various institutions. And our Malaysian Mediation Center is the oldest mediation institution in Malaysia. Um, as I mentioned, China and Malaysia are yeah, signatories to the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Uh, Malaysia is still a pending ratification of the convention and the amendment to the Mediation Act. However, that is not a bar to any mediation that can even happen now because we have the mechanisms in place to, uh, to carry out mediations. Um, just for the benefit of our friends who are tuning in, Post amendment to the Mediation Act, these are the possible features that we are hopeful will be in uh, the new Act, and that would relate to enforcement provisions relating to the mediated settlement agreements, uh, regulations on the standards of mediators, uh, incentives for swift problem solving, and, and codes of conduct uh, for mediators to abide by. Now, um, I think this is just to identify the various areas where we see an immediate utility of mediation going forward, debt resolution. Uh, there's a lot of money owed and a simple demand may not necessarily yield or unlock cash or payments. Uh, debt resolution looks like it may be helped along by mediation. We are going to see the collapse of some businesses 
And uh, in the process of doing schemes of arrangement, voluntary arrangements, restructuring, and even insolvency, um, mediation can play a role to help bridge the, 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 the claims that may be made against a company facing um, imminent collapse. Um, I think Jeff touched on this. Mediation can play a very vital role in employment matters, renegotiations, terminations, and even if it hasn't come to that, um, I, mediation can play a role in helping to bridge some of the different perceptions that employers and employees may have in terms of um, what may happen post-COVID. People are already talking about um, layoffs and pay cuts, and these are things that may entrench parties into their respective positions. And a mediator may be useful to help build the bridge to enlarge the pie, as we say in mediation, so that parties are able to think creatively on the paces that need to be made forward. Uh, we are all not out of the woods yet. Uh, um, I, I, I have been reading information which says that we're going to take 12 months to 18 months to get out of this fully. And one of the biggest fears that a lot of people have is that we'll have a repeat cycle of um, infection, which will put us back to where we are right now. And so employers and employees are certainly going to be worried about what may happen, and mediators can play a role there. In the construction industry, we are already hearing the tensions on the ground uh, and the difficulties that many stakeholders are having in the construction industry. Um, Adjudication is available, but it takes time. Arbitration is available, it takes time. And so mediation might be the solution for the parties, and it gives the parties an opportunity to even have multi-party mediations, where all the right stakeholders come and have a discussion on the way forward. In general contractual obligations, even today, a contractual obligation which uh, may be pending in July or September or December, uh, parties may be worried about compliance. Um, in fact, in one um, contractual obligation where there's a payment due on the 30th of April, everything was looking fine, uh, but the party who has a compliance deadline of 30th of April has already become worried about his compliance obligations and has commenced renegotiations last week itself. So we're going to be seeing more and more of this going forward. Why will mediation matter post-COVID? And this is where I think we need to all sit back and where decision makers and lawyers and advisors need to look at the situation objectively and recognize that, yes, we have all the adversarial approaches available. But at the end of the day, winning may not translate to a cash payout. And if the approach is that we can wind up our judgment data, the reality is that it, that is even less likely going to result in positive cash. So if the objective is to unlock cash flow, perhaps mediation needs to be taken a good look at to see how it can be utilized to achieve that goal. Uh, I mentioned earlier that mediation and corporate negotiations is something that has been talked about very underutilized, um, even in contracts where no dispute has arisen. Um, parties may want to start thinking about their compliance obligations down the line and engage in some good natured discussions on whether there would be any flexibility built into these contractual obligations. Uh, and this may require renegotiation. A mediator may be required to come in to start that sensitive conversation to help the parties um, look into the future to see how they can ensure that they don't fall into dispute or uh, into breach of their contract. So in summary, these are the benefits of mediation. It is swift. And in terms of cost effectiveness, it's cost effective. It is not necessarily cheap. And given that all the professionals who are going to be putting time and effort to help navigate the parties, this needs to be reflected in the reward structure. Uh, as I shared in another webinar, one of the reasons we have seen a very slow growth of mediation 
um, generally is because lawyers were not very familiar with how to value their services in a mediation. Today, if parties really understand and require lawyers to find the swift, swiftest, cleverest, uh, most cost-effective solution, lawyers can articulate to their clients the value that they're bringing to the table and um, it, it will be cost effective for the parties at the end of the day. Uh, when can mediation start? It can start at the collaborative stage, even when parties are still talking to each other and even when things become a bit contentious. At the contentious stage, a lot depends on the advisor. And um, while in mediation, um, our Malaysian mediation rules, they're not tedious, they're very simple to follow. And I'm sure following the MOU, um, the mediation rules that will come out of this uh, will be something that will not be tedious for the parties to comply with. I've shared about how it's flexible. And given that we may be looking into a future of online mediation, um, this flexibility can be fleshed out and, and in the future looks. Uh, very, very interesting, and I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, we all know about social distance. We're supposed to keep a birth from everyone during this time, and if we do use online mediation, we satisfy the need for social distancing. And in terms of cross-border mediation, that's already happening. A, a point to note, um, it, it was actually China in 2015, when speaking about the Belt and Road, uh, uh, plans and the potential disputes, it was China that first said that mediation would be their preferred choice. And that started better discussions even in Malaysia about the role mediation was going to play. And as you can see today, we are entering into an MOU. Uh, there have been lots of dialogues with uh, our different counterparties. This is something that we can do. And this will benefit the Malaysians and the Chinese and other uh, counterparties from around the world. So now just to share, Malaysia is getting ready to be a Malaysian uh, mediation hub. We are signing, uh, we have signed the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Today we are signing the MOU. And as Jeff pointed out, uh, because of the COVID crisis and the tensions that we've already seen on the ground, uh, the Malaysian Mediation Center is formulating the National COVID-19 Mediation Initiative. And this is to help our domestic market as well, because we foresee that there is going to be a need for smart dispute resolution going forward. Um, getting our professionals ready. So this is to share with our friends in China and around the world. Uh, the mediators in Malaysia, trained by the Malaysian Mediation Center, we are tr we've trained our mediators to accommodate lawyers during mediation. We have looked at the mediation landscape for many years, more than 10 years, and the recognition was that lawyers were not given sufficient, sufficiently respectable space at the table. Uh, there were institutions that have mediations but um, exclude the lawyers. And the reality, the frank reality, is that any dispute resolution methodology that excludes the lawyers is not likely to take off. And therefore, we have made sure that our mediators know how to accommodate lawyers. In fact, to tap into the valuable skills that lawyers bring to the table because they are the ones who will prepare clients for mediations. And clients will look to lawyers for that sometimes that nudge to make a decision to accept a, a solution that is presented to them. Um, to support this, mediation advocacy must be economically sustainable. You cannot do it as a charity job. You cannot do it as a favor for the client. This needs to be a, a, a truly respected and valued, valued skill. So the mediation rules that currently are available in Malaysia with some interesting provisions where um, there is a possibility that pending the ratification of the Singapore Convention on Mediation where more options for enforcement may be available, parties can still, uh, before uh, signing the Mediator Settlement Agreement, choose to convert that to an arbitral award which can be enforced under the New York Convention. That remains something available even now. 
um, cross-border online mediation is going to be a reality and most mediators are getting ready to, and they have online platforms and similarly uh, we foresee that uh, in, in our interactions with our friends in China online mediations is going to be part of our reality and we will need to build on that. Of course there are concerns about online mediation as excited as we may be we must be aware and come up with strategies and assurances relating to confidentiality because there will be interface between advisors and clients we must be able to articulate how advisors and clients are able to communicate even during a mediation and we have to uh, formulate ideas for parties to consider how the interface will be between the mediators and the parties uh, this particular setup where we see ourselves in, in just this window. Um, there needs to be new lessons for mediators on how to manage uh, a mediation online. Um, what more if parties choose co-mediation? And co-mediation is likely to be the strategy going forward uh, because both parties may want the comfort of having a mediator of choice. Co-mediations work very well uh, and co-mediators must be also able to interface with each other. Um, as online mediation becomes more sophisticated, uh, elements like document management, the, the involvement of experts, as well as the concern about the proper authorization of decision. Um, normally in warm body mediations, all this is done in person. We are able to verify who has come to the roof. And these are some of the things going forward that will become a new challenge to all of us, but a challenge I'm sure all of us will rise up to. The use of electronic signatures will also need to be established uh, for the purposes of online mediation. And even uh, preparation for mediation will need to be uh, articulated so that parties understand what needs to be prepared and sent to the mediators in advance in order for the mediators to prepare for the mediation. So uh, in wrapping up my presentation, I say this. In these post-COVID times, uh, these COVID times, we are here and we are in this together. This is a, while it's a global problem, this is something that we're all facing at different stages and we are seeing the problems on the ground. So parties need to ask themselves, yes, there are gonna be disputes and there are gonna be problems. Some may seem insurmountable and Old ways may seem like good ways, but for that purpose, uh, our clients as well as ourselves, we need to ask, what is it that we actually need? What is it that the parties actually need? Is there time and money for litigation and arbitration in these times? And are the right advisors giving the effective solutions to help parties get where they need to go? The question of whether your counterparty is having cash flow issues or business issues is a very, very important one to consider before undertaking adversarial approaches. Because in these times, it is almost an open secret that every industry is going to be having their own cash and business issue. And if the option is to go and enforce, the question is, would that be more good money thrown after bad? Or perhaps would an authentic conversation held in a mediation, the parties are able to share where their, their challenges are and to strategize how to meet their obligation. Would that be a more effective uh, and better solution? And on that note, thank you all very much and please stay safe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jeff and uh, Ms. Shanti. Uh, let's see, any questions? Okay, I will just prepare one question because I uh, feel uh, uh, the topic is very interesting. So I got a, uh, one question regarding uh, the first world issue. For example, if uh, a Chinese exporter exports goods to Malaysia, and then the importer in the Malaysia say, hey, now due to the COVID-19, you know, 
we are really light over the cash flow. We have nobody to pay. So I see from Jeff's uh, presentation, you know, only for payments, there's no excuse to apply for some lower uh, clauses. So I would like to confirm under this situation, because the void is really, uh, impact is very huge worldwide, not only China, but also many other countries. So regarding if under such cases, the importer really have uh, no money to make payment, could the importer in, Ma in Malaysia um, to uh, 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 apply the possible rules under uh, the laws in Malaysia? I, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, in this situation, yeah, sure. uh, the way uh, we will analyze it here in Malaysia is to look at the contract. What does the contract say? Uh, in two areas. Uh, one, uh, what is the governing law? Is the governing law China, Malaysia? And sometimes contracts don't say anything about the governing law. Then we are going into the standard uh, uh, class, classic textbook, uh, private international question. What is the proper law of the contract? What is the law that should apply due to this contract? So is this, this sort of areas that you have disputes on. No? And then once you determine the law, then you look at the contract itself. What does the clause on cost clause major say? The clause on force major doesn't talk about payment. Payment should not be protected by a force major clause. Then you have no choice but to pay. Because in that situation that you are uh, explaining to me, I think the contract is already performed before the crisis happened. It's just that they have not paid. So I think if it's a situation like that, I think under the law of Malaysia, the law of Malaysia law is chosen, I'm quite sure that a force major clause would not excuse a person uh, from not paying because it's not caused by uh, it's not covered by the, the force major clause itself. I think Dato and Ashanti, you are free also to chip in as well. And Dato, if you speak, you have to unmute your mic. Okay. Yes, Jeff, uh, uh, I, have, I have nothing to add because you have, you have answered that, that question very well. Yes. I, and from, uh, the only thing I will add is, uh, if the position, as Jeff says, is that the force majeure uh, clause does not allow the Malaysian party to avoid his payment, the question then will be is, if he's unable to make that payment, uh, what are the options for the Chinese party? And, and that is where uh, typically, before lawyers come in, they may engage in some sort of negotiations. And if they reach some up impasses, um, this is an option available to parties before they commence the more adversarial um, dispute resolution methods to say, can we have a conversation and perhaps we'll appoint a mediator because we need to find some solutions. Uh, we know what our options are. We can pursue this to where its natural end will be, but that's not our goal right now. What we need is payment and we would like to have a mediation perhaps fixed this week itself um, and with our MOU and once uh, the rules are all rolled out, you know, this would be the right place to come and say we need a mediator within X number of days. These are the documents. And you can see how everything is narrowed down to we've got an opinion, payment is due, but we need to have a discussion on payment schedule, for example. Okay, thank you. And then we, uh, I think we got some other questions from the audience. One is question regarding uh, how to ascertain the laws. So the question is, what do you think about the function of ascertaining the law before or during the international mediation? Is it helpful? This is the question. I think uh, maybe I should say something here. Uh, to explain to Shanti and our friends from around the world. I think China, you go to Chinese court, if a foreign law is uh, applicable, they have to ascertain that foreign law. What is the foreign law? So the question is, before you reach the court, do the parties uh, intending to go to court but want to use mediation uh, to resolve this, have to ascertain the law? I think the answer is yes, because that contract is governed by a certain government law. So having an understanding of the government law is uh, important. Uh, the way that common law countries have always relied on uh, uh, finding what the law is 
uh, it is not through the university like in China or through a, 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 a center uh, that is not a law firm. We just go to our fellow lawyers from other countries and ask them, this is the issue, what is the law? And then they'll give you some answer there and then we move from there. Uh, I think this is where the civil law system in China and the common law system and other systems around the world will have to adjust to each other. But you're right, I think if you want to go to mediation, I think you still need to know what is your position under the law. But Shanti will tell you, and I'll let her explain to you, when you reach a mediator, it is no longer what is right or what is wrong. Because uh, knowing that you can be under the law is important, but mediation is usually not decided by who is right under the law. Ashanti, you want to explain it? Uh, I'm just, yes, I think you've identified it um, uh, spot on, Jeff. Um, once the parties come for mediation, the fact that you will win in your jurisdiction or in law may help in the discussion, but uh, that is only just to set the foundation of the, the, the first part of the mediation. After that, uh, while the parties have expressed their positions, they will be taken to what is uh, some of the options going forward to find the solution. We all know that if you go to court, you will win. But whether you'll actually get anything out of that. European countries. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think that, you know, our uh, media center also works together with many uh, uh, Chinese local governments. For example, we work together with uh, Guangzhou Nanxia governments to establish a uh, uh, center to, uh, uh, to um, do some research and find out uh, the foreign laws. So I think it's uh, also during the precise uh, mediation, you know, how to find out the laws, how to find out the, uh, the laws of, uh, of other countries will also be very important. Okay, uh, I thank again uh, to Jeff and Shanti for their wonderful lectures. Uh, and then we come to a second part. Now it's time for our signing ceremony. The session will start by uh, addresses by representatives uh, from the two parties. First, uh, let's welcome Ms. Wang Li, Chairman of Belt Road Service Connections, President of Beijing Racial, Legal and Commercial Service Center for Belt Road Initiative, Director of International Commercial Media Center for the Belt Road, please. Thank you very much. So this this is a great event. We are just uh, you know through the critical situation we come together. We think about how would we happen. Maybe after that the current violence, there are a lot of uh, disputes to come. And uh, you know, under our Belarus service connections, the mediation center. We think about that. So we think about who will get more contract between two countries, uh, multiple countries. China made a lot of contract with the international uh, uh, companies as well as the Malaysia also have a very tremendous contract with China and other countries. So I think that maybe we think about, we prepare for that. And just to listen, Jeff and uh, Shani, we uh, share the experience and uh, the understanding of the, uh, you know, of the, the new situation and uh, how to promote our uh, mediation. I think that this is the right time. So, it's the form of the signing MOU uh, ceremony. So I turn to Chinese and say something. Distinguished, uh, the Malaysia Health Education Chief, Nato Kudubu Sabu Bukhari, Chen Yamba 
我们现在每一个人都希望我们的朋友、我们的同事、我们的遍布世界各地的调解员、我们的律师都是 healthy， 非常健康，而且呢，我们都充满着信心，在努力的工作。今天是我们。国际商业调解公益讲座第一期线上直播，那么来自世界各地的调解员和律师和专业人士都在分享我们这个公益的讲课。刚才 Jack 和莎莉给我们带来了非常精彩的一课，我都仔细的听了。那么现在疫情，那疫情是全球性的，造成了每一个国家。各个企业，他们的资金链、产业链，包括他们的员工，包括现在所有的 lockdown 带来的，那么员工失业和合同不能履行，这样一些风险，那么如果都去法院，都去仲裁，我们全球的法官都会很忙。但是呢，由于刚才讲到。我们疫情是一个不可抗力，这个 virus 是人类的敌人。那么面对着人类的敌人跟我们的进攻，我们怎么去有效的解决我们企业与企业、人与人之间的这个矛盾和纠纷？这需要我们更加智慧，这需要我们考虑应该以和谐的方式。企业之间以调解为主的方式来解决纠纷，即使是走到了法院，走到了仲裁厅，也可以结合法律的这个程序和我们调解的这个程序，也可以结合仲裁的程序和调解的程序，这样我们可以更有利于人与人之间关系的缓和。新的 contract 谈判重新开始，新的贸易投资重新开始。我相信今天我们从今天的讲座当中，我们听课的人都能从中得到一些收益。今天我们要完成的签约仪式，是我们以实际行动表明，在疫情面前，人们、人类是不能输的。那么，我们“一带一路”商事调解和商事服务是不会停止的。在困难面前，不管是哪个国家的人，不管是哪个国家、哪个行业，尤其是像我们法律人，我们绝不会低头。我们一定要团结起来，共同抗争，一定会克服这些困难。没有一个冬天不可逾越。没有一个春天不会到来。那么，在这样一个疫情严峻的时刻，我们越是要把我们的国际商事调解工作做好，这就是对我们抗疫的最大的贡献和支持。经过两个多月的讨论，“一带一路”服务机制支持北京龙商“一带一路”法律商事服务中心及“一带一路”国际商事调解中心与马来西亚调解中心达成了。关于设立“一带一路”国际商事调解中心、马来西亚吉隆坡区域调解史的合作备忘录，促进调解以及其他多元化争议解决方式的合作，我们各方一致认为，通过线上与线下调解相结合的方式，来推广和谐的、互利的、平等的调解文化。约定调解所达成的和解协议。那么需要在马来西亚和中国的法律框架内，在新加坡公约精神，呃，指引下，促进当事人诚信自觉的履行。今天我们的协议签署后，我们将与马来西亚调解中心相互推荐合适的专家和调解员，设立中马调解员联合专家组。在解决国际商事纠纷，就案件适用的调解规则和程序，双方关心的调解问题
和调理实践经验，进行积极的信息交流，在适当可行的情况下，开展研发项目和培训方面的合作，建立有效的信息化智能纠纷解决平台，共同致力于维护在“一带一路”沿线国家从事经济、投资、贸易、商业活动的主体的合法权益。减少交易成本，降低投资风险，有效的解决矛盾和纠纷，鼓励更多的企业把国际商事调解作为合同纠纷解决的首选，营造共建项目、共解纠纷、共享收益、共建人类命运共同体。最后，我想说，今天的签约是一个线上线下结合的特殊的云签约方式，因为疫情。大家都不能够到北京，也不能够到吉隆坡现场，所以今天的云签约首先实现了我们国际商事调解 O V R 的 online 呃、uh, working style. This is a good beginning. Uh, finally, we would like to say this、uh, signing ceremony is a special online signing. Which、uh, combine online and offline, using a sentence for Asian Chinese poetry to express my mood right now. That is a Jia Qi Fang He Xu, Po Su Ji Ying Duan, which means the good time should be、uh, promised. Otherwise, we can only put our medicine to the blood. I believe that we will. Certainly, have the better reunion in a beautiful city. All in all, let us work closely to promote a good level mediation room and provide a good example on international commercial mediation in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Miss、uh, Wang. In the next, let's welcome Mr.、Uh, Nadu Gudugu、uh, Salman Bukali, the chairman of Malaysia Media Center. Please. Thank you,、uh, Harrison.、Uh, ladies and gentlemen,、uh, on behalf of the Malaysian Media Center, I'd like to thank the International Commercial Media Center of the Belt and Road, or BMRMC. In organizing this afternoon's program, I also like to welcome all of you, those in this Zoom cloud meeting, for your participation in today's program. And I understand there are quite a number from、uh, overseas, including Malaysia and other countries as well. As you may. Be aware by now that Malaysia is currently under lockdown.、Uh, almost all of us are at home, and this is something different、uh, from a normal、uh, signing ceremony of a collaboration between two organisations. In the past, what we do is. When we enter into a negotiation with any other organization, and once we have finalized it, we have to fly in to their、uh, respective country,、uh, attend the signing ceremony,、uh, and so on. However, in this Asian time with the pandemic of COVID nineteen, signing ceremony can only be done by using available technology. And when we do a signing ceremony like this and、uh, attending lectures like this, you will realize that there are a lot of things are missing. There's no thunderous applause after each speakers. There are、uh, no clicking of、uh, cameras, taking photographs, you know, and no real witnesses uh, to uh, see the execution of the agreement. And no exchange of agreement immediately after signing. So all these are things which、uh, we will, will not be able to do in the current situation. However, we are rather grateful that 
we have reached this level and we are able to have this ceremony despite various difficulties. Now, the Malaysian Meditation Center is also grateful uh, to both our representative, uh, Jeff Leong, and also to Dr. Uh, Wang Lee uh, from the BNRMC uh, for, the, uh, for agreeing to partner us uh, in setting up the BNRMC branch in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, currently, we are in the midst of uh, finalizing the joint mediation rules to govern the center in Kuala Lumpur. And we hope that parties will be able to commence mediation as soon as possible. As you are all aware that this will be an online mediation service and there is no necessity of meeting parties face-to-face uh, -face and so on. So especially cross-border international mediation, I think this is a faster method of resolving any dispute. Mediation is not something new in Asia. Uh, all of you all know. We are all Asians, most of us. And our forefathers have been mediating community disputes and other kind of uh, disputes through mediations since civilization, Asian civilization. Okay. And I'm sure we as mediators would be able to resolve all such disputes uh, within Asia or outside Asia as well. Let me take this opportunity to uh, indeed have learned of, uh, on the excellent presentations. Uh, if you look at the chat room, there have been a lot of uh, questions raised, but unfortunately, I think uh, I'm not sure that it's due to time or whether uh, Harrison is not able to uh, see those questions, that these questions are not being answered by the speakers. Hopefully, I think in future, when we organize such uh, lectures and talks, I think we need to uh, handle this uh, situation a bit better. Okay? Uh, finally, let me uh, conclude that with the signing of this MOU, uh, MOU uh, it is our sincere hope that both our organizations will be able to establish a BNRMC in Kuala Lumpur and to launch the center after finalizing the mediation rules. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And now, please. Uh... Ms. Wani and Mr. Nadu, please look through uh, the MOU on cooperation and sound name on the end of the page. At this time, I would like to uh, introduce more about the two parties. Uh, Malaysia Media Center was uh, established in 1999 under uh, the Bar Council of Malaysia with the objective of promoting mediation as a means of uh, alternative dispute resolution to provide a proper avenue for successful dispute resolution through mediation. International Commercial Mediation Center for the Belt and Road, BRMC, who is a branch of uh, Beijing Racial, Legal and Commercial Service Center for Belt and Road Initiative, was awarded as a sub project unit of alternative dispute resolution in 2016 by Judicial Reform Office of the Supreme People's Court of the People's Republic of China. In recent years, BRMC relies on its online mediation system to achieve six connections functions, including connections between mediation and litigation, litigation and arbitration, mediation and notarization, domestic and international, civil and official, online mediation and offline mediation. These six connections work well for the alternative dispute resolution. It's great. Let's see the two parties both signed MOU. I extended my warmest congratulations to you. I think this uh, cooperation will help uh, both parties to have uh, solid cooperation in the future. 
and uh, uh, help uh, the companies in villages to uh, lawfully settle their commercial trade and investment disputes arising from the bad road in, uh, initiatives. Oh, I okay, we're fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think later uh, both parties will exchange uh, the signing uh, pages. Uh, lastly, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Jeff played a very important role to promote uh, cooperation between the two parties. Let us invite uh, Mr. Jeff Long for giving us uh, a couple of words since we worked together for this cooperation about two months during this. Uh, outbreak of uh, uh, COVID-19. Okay, thank you, Harrison. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate both parties for the signing of the MOU today, uh, which will signal the beginning of a great journey together for the International Commercial Mediation Center for the Belt and Road, as well as for Malaysian Mediation Center. Uh, the COVID-19 economic crisis will cause many disputes to arise between Chinese companies and their business partners all over the world. Through the joint effort of uh, MMC, uh, Malaysian Mediation Centre, and also BNM, BNRMC, uh, a joint panel of mediators uh, will have the work cut out for them. And uh, we will use mediation as the forefront method to resolve COVID-19 fourth major disputes going forward and help parties reserve their business uh, preserve the business and economic relationships and recover from the crisis. So to everyone around the world, thank you for your support and stay safe and healthy always. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jeff. Uh, thank you again for your uh, great support. Uh, now the conference is uh, over. Uh, please scan uh, the code on our uh, website. Uh, we chat official account for the further uh, information. We look, we look forward to your uh, further participation in the future, and we also uh, stand by to assist you in any way uh, we can. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, uh, everyone. Please stay healthy, safe, and happy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.